Hello and welcome. Today we're going to be talking about babies and how they grow and develop. Or we can call it infancy, something a little more fancy, but why not babies? Yay! So this should be a fun lecture. Very in-depth, obviously, because we're going to be talking about babies and there is just so much to know. And where do you even begin? So generally in developmental psychology, we begin with fertilization and then we go from there. And then we have a bunch of stages like birth to one, one to two, you know, three and four, five to seven, seven to 11, 11 to 15. However, we want to categorize it again is totally arbitrary as we've discussed in other um, lectures. But there are certain milestones that we should be aware of that are maybe universal when it comes to the human experience, you know. So today we're going to kind of focus on that. Uh, so to open it up, beginnings, conception, and prenatal development, again, with developmental psychology, when we're talking about the growth of humans throughout the lifespan, of course, we're going to start there with fertilization and what happens before the baby's even born, just because so much is happening while in the, in the womb, such as growth and development, that we have to understand what's going on. Um, <clears throat> so behavioral genetics is the scientific study of the interplay between genetic and environmental contributions to behavior. Again, in this class, we always take a biopsychosocial approach to development. So we're wondering what's going on biologically with the baby's development, the brain, and then, you know, cognition and things along those lines as we get a little bit further on, and then the influence of the social context. And it's hard to imagine that the social context can influence your genes, but that's the way it works, as we'll discuss in the bottom here when we talk about epigenetics. So again, when we're thinking about developmental psychology, we have to go from the out in and then from the in out and then the interplay between these social forces and biological and psychological forces. And again, it's commonly simply referred to as the nature nurture debate, but however you want to phrase that is completely fine. I always generally take the biopsychosocial approach just because it's easier for me to think like that. You know, it's just a way of kind of thinking about how all these fields, you know, interact. But then also I put on here historical and cultural, because again, how do we understand what's going on with modern times and how we're growing if we don't understand how we got here and then how the culture structures us, this is the language, value systems, ideologies of the place that we live, okay? So throughout the developmental psychology class, we're always talking about the interplay between environmental factors, behavioral and psychological factors, and then genetic expression. And then how does all that influence our social behavior and then how does the social environment influence our genetic expression? Again, it's very, very complex. So even though we're in psychology and the main focus is the brain, again, psychology, I like to think is kind of in between two worlds, the social context and the biology of the body. Um, epigenetics is then defined as environmental factors such as nutrition, stress, and teratogens that have an effect on gene expression. Again, so our DNA is built to, you know, evolve or adapt to environmental factors, depending upon where in the planet we are, uh, heat, amount of sun, things like that can totally influence things. But so do social factors like nutrition, because again, if a kid's not getting a new, enough nutrition because they're being malnourished in the social context, is that going to affect their growth in the end? When you study intelligence, again, the most important thing is, did that kid eat today? And so again, that interplay between environmental factors, like is there a supportive environment where there's love and care and food can play a big role. What's the environment like? Are they drinking clean water? You know, are they getting good quality food? What's going on there? And so all of these factors then affect our actual body and the way we think. It's so complex. Um, but again, in the book then talks about how environmental factors can influence, you know, how we end up and our outcomes over the time. And they say, you know, when they look at monozygotic or identical twins, at first they're very similar. But then if you look at them across the lifespan, do you start to see different genetic expressions over time? And you do. And you would think that if they were identical, they wouldn't have divergent genetic expression. But as a result of environmental factors and other psychological factors, you know, like stress, for example, that can happen. So, so prenatal development, your book breaks it down into three phases. We're going to first talk about the germinal phase, which is about 14 days in length. It lasts from conception to the implantation of the fertilized egg in the lining of the uterus. Then you have your embryonic period, the third week to the eighth week 
Um, this is when the embryo and the placenta forms. I'm not even going to try to say half these words because I'll mess them all up, but cephalocaudal development. Again, the book talks about how we grow from our head out, okay? And then proximodistal development, which is like your midline, your, like your hips down to your feet, for example, or out to your hands, for example. We start from the center and work our way out. Those words always crack me up. And so again, you know, you don't have to necessarily memorize these words, but, you know, just to throw some of these words at you. And then I quoted the book just to explain it, you know, but again, just because they're big words like cephalocaudal and proximodistal. And it says this means that those structures nearest the head develop before those nearest the feet. And those structures near your torso or your hips develop away from the center of your body toward your hands and your fingers and things like that. The head develops in the fourth week and the precursor to the heart begins the pulse in the fourth week and the early stages of the embryonic period. We also have gills and a tail. <laughs> so I just wanted to quote the book there. And then, however, by the end of the stage, those disappear and the organism takes on a more human appearance. And again, why do we have gills and a tail? That goes way back to evolution and us coming out of the sea and becoming land creatures. And then, you know, the tree of life just splitting in all kinds of directions and many branches. Um, you also have the fetal period, which is then eighth week to birth. So again, we got the germinal period, the first two weeks, then you got the embryonic period, the third week to the eighth week. And then the eighth week to birth is going to be the fetal period. And then your books talks about the age of viability is about 24 weeks when the smallest baby can be born with help. Um, at around 36 weeks, the fetus is ready for birth, weighs six pounds and is 18 and a half inches long. By week 37, everything is pretty well fully formed for the baby to survive outside the mother's uterus. And by week 40, that baby is ready to come out. Prenatal brain development. Okay, so this begins in the third week with the differentiation of stem cells. And I define stem cells, as your book does, as cells that are capable of being any cell that is needed by the brain to form. Okay, it's located in with the, uh, the neural plate. And there are two ridges that appear that become the neural groove and the neural tube. And again, the book has some good anatomy on this, but just kind of imagine this part of your brain, then there's a big hole in the brain somewhere in the middle. And that then goes down and becomes this, uh, the spinal cord and things along those lines. So again, the open region in the center of the neural tube forms the vein ventricle and the spinal canal, which eventually becomes your spinal cord, okay, which is just a whole bunch of nerves going from your brain all the way down to your toes and your hands, okay. By the end of the embryonic period or week eight, the neural tube has been further differentiated in the forebrain, midbrain, and the hindbrain. And again, as you learn in, you know, usually an intro psychology class, or if you're studying, uh, you know, any neuroscience of any kind, the brain kind of formed in three different phases over evolution. You have your, you know, your original part of the inner part of your brain, that's like your brain stem that controls your heartbeat and your breathing. Then you have the limbic system in the middle, which is like more emotions and slightly higher level functioning. And then you have your outer cortex, which evolved last. And that's our ability of humans to do things like math and science and reflection and think outside the box and the theory of the mind and putting yourself in somebody else's shoes and you know complex language. All of that evolves much later in human evolution. So again, that baby's brain is going through these phases, just like the evolution. Same thing with having gills in the tail. You know, our DNA starts with one process, builds on that over millions of years. And so really our DNA is just processes upon processes that just have to go through their phases for us to evolve into what we are, which again is way more complex biology than we need for today. Um, but, you know, if you're interested in this kind of stuff, neurogenesis. By five months, most of the brain's 85 billion neurons are formed and organized into position. Again, by five months, that brain, had, and, you know, along with this DNA coding that is directing the traffic, is forming all the parts of the brain that you will need to be able to function as a modern human. And most of that is fully formed by five months. Of course, those neural pathways will then develop after that as you learn and things along those lines. But the only one that really just keeps expanding and neurons are completely being brand new um, is in the hippocampus. And I like this argument because, you know, in the hippocampus is a lot of our emotional centers are located in there. And so I kind of put in a little bit of joke here, you know, is that why wisdom occurs over time? Because the hippocampus is just like this constantly evolving, you know, not organ, but, you know, part of our brain, you know, 
And the rest of it's just kind of, eh, <laughs> why we were happy the way we were born. But again, is that kind of why we become more emotionally intelligent over time? Is that why our wisdom grows, for example? And then as you break down the brain, as our cell, as our brain is actually growing, it divides into the gray matter, which is the cell bodies, and the white matter that becomes the dendrites. So for teratogens, again, you might have heard this, but these are, again, these environmental factors that can cause harm to the baby. Um, so the study of factors that contribute to birth defects is called teratology. And then teratogens are environmental factors that contribute to birth defects. And they include parental diseases, um, pollutants like lead poisoning, pesticides, mercury, drugs. And the babies can become addicted. They can end up with small heads, premature birth, birth defects. Uh, tobacco causes ectopic pregnancy, pl placenta previa, placenta abruption, and alcohol causing these uh, fetal alcohol syndromes and small eyes, flattened nose, small head, just some of the factors that can happen as a result of teratogens. Um, there's also things like taximoplosis, which is a tiny parasite. And so that actually affects with a book set of 60 million Americans, you know, which is quite a few. Uh, sexually transmitted diseases can affect the babies. Having HIV can be passed down. Things like measles can be passed down, which can be detrimental for children. Um, there are also things like maternal and parental factors. Again, things like the age of the parents is a big deal. Again, as a man becomes older, the viability of sperm, for example, tends to decline. Same thing with the female's body and ability to do things. That's why birth defects tend to increase after you get to a certain age. Teenage pregnancy is a big factor because the female's body is not necessarily fully formed. So getting pregnant, you know, early can have detrimental effects, not just on the mother, but also the baby itself. Uh, gestational diabetes and health concerns, fertility problems, premature birth, uh, stillborns, baby having genetic disorders or other defects, high blood pressure, all are threats to babies, uh, RH disease, weight gain for the mother can have a huge effect. And also not having enough weight can have a huge effect, not gaining enough weight during pregnancy. Because again, fat is important for these kinds of things, the right amount of fat, for example. So we have to consider these things. Um, stress can affect the mother and baby. Depression, same thing. Father's exposure to work environments can be passed down to kids. It's just there's so many different things. But that's why, you know, over time and our science has improved and our education has improved and we're able to go out and teach mothers and fathers like, hey, folic acid, things like that can really have a factor. Having the vitamins that you need every day, you know, not eating certain kinds of foods that can be harmful for the baby, alcohol. So again, our bodies <clears throat> haven't evolved like a fear or a sickness. Like the reason a woman gets like sick when they're pregnant is their body's way of telling you, hey, these are the foods and things that you're not supposed to eat that it's learned over millennia. But alcohol is just a recent invention. So mother's bodies haven't learned that, you know, alcohol can cause an effect. Therefore, it doesn't have the same kind of effect as other types of like morning sickness or whatever else you might be feeling when you're pregnant might have. And so that's just a, an interesting kind of tidbit is that we just recently invented alcohol. Our bodies haven't had a chance to evolutionarily catch up to know that alcohol is bad for the babies, for example. And then the book also talks about things like how many mothers don't even know they're pregnant. And they're out drinking or still smoking at the time or whatever it might be. And so uh, these are factors that we need to consider. Okay. Uh, the graph on the left talks about some of the problems that are associated with chromosomes or genes or teratogens, for example, and it breaks it down. Um, problems with the newborn, just to, you know, when the baby is born, we have to do some certain checks. So they have the APGAR assessment. It's, this occurs at one minute and five minutes after birth. Um, you can have other problems like anoxia, such as lack of oxygen, low birth weight for the babies, being preterm be, uh, before 37 weeks, okay? And so, yeah, the doctors check for heart rate, respiratory effort, muscle tone, reflex, color, one minute and five minutes after, and they rate it. And so anything below a five is a concern, and then they always hope that over time that these numbers will improve over time. Uh, so there's some, the book brings up some good debates about reflexes versus instincts. And this has always stuck with me since my first introduction to uh, psychology class. And I was told in that class that we don't have instincts. And, you know, animals have instincts, but humans don't. And that's always something that kind of stuck with me. And I don't even know if that's true or not. And again, a lot of things are just philosophy or just theories. But, you know, is the reflex and instinct the same exact thing is a pretty good question. 
Um, and so it's just a philosophical idea that I'm throwing out there. But the book defines reflexes as these involuntary movements in response to stimulation. And it gives examples such as sucking or rooting, grasping, stepping, eye blinking, swallowing, sneezing, gagging, withdrawal, uh, Babinski, which is where your toes curl when you are heel to toe, for example. Uh, and so we have the chart from our book that is, you know, breaks it all down. And so again, are these instincts, are these reflexes is a, you know, interesting debate. It's just, uh, you know, just words in the end. But, you know, it's interesting to think about. Are we a blank slate, truly? You know, is the brain born? Are we born with a blank slate? Are we born with the capacity to reach out and the capacity for language and the capacity to suck and to try to walk, you know, or is that in us? Or is that just all stuff we have to learn over time? And so, again, it always brings back the question for me, how much of the, you know, your body and your unconscious mind are really driving the car and how much of your conscious mind are driving the car? Because even if we don't have reflexes or instincts necessarily, or however we define those, our unconscious mind still has a lot of motivation and drive. It is pushing us to cry, to reach out. You know, that will to live, for example, is that built into us? Is our humanity and to live as a human built into us where we seek out to live as a human? It's just some cool philosophical ideas. Um, but the book says in preterm and if a baby is impaired, these may be absent at birth. And so, again, there can be some detrimental effects uh, to babies if we don't take a lot of caution and and some things that you just can't even control. Like you, sometimes there's chromosomal mixes that, you know, result in birth defects, but the parents don't know that they each share that gene that when cross caused this type of a baby, for example. And so things like that will happen all the time. Uh, attachment is a really cool idea that's covered during this chapter. Um, it, the book always brings up Eric Erickson's, uh, you know, tasks or stages. And again, we always have the discussion of, and the book even talks about the critiques of Erickson, whether or not we all evolve in stages and these timelines. But again, I point to these milestones, right? There are these milestones that could demarcate what a healthy human looks like. And so Erickson, you know, describes this infancy stage as learning to trust or mistrust your caregivers, developing that secure attachment with someone where you're comfortable or not developing it and learning that mistrust with the world. And whether or not a zero to two year old baby can learn trust or mistrust is a whole different argument. But again, you know, our brain does get into those patterns of learned behavior and then our expectations, you know, are they going to be there for us? Are they not going to be there for us? And is our brain thinking about this when we're not young? I don't know. It's a really good question, but it's something to think about. But again, uh, these secure relationships with the, ta the caregiver, that's that stage of learning trust versus mistrust. And, you know, Erickson says it, the babies don't, develop that secure attachment, it could interfere with their overall development. And is that true? You know, is not having someone to care for you and, or maybe having really harsh parents, for example, or being raised in a harsh environment where there's not a lot of love and hugging and things along those lines, does that really interfere with development? Or is that just a different type of development? And again, that's all arbitrary and that's all based upon cultural ways of life. Again, the idea of childhood and like caring for our children and loving for them is new. Back in the day, like when I teach marriage and family, I, you know, children were seen as economic values. You didn't really love on your children until they were older because so many of them died. And that's a harsh way of looking at reality. But maybe that's the way culture used to be hundreds of years ago. And that's discussed in my marriage and family book, which is why we have to talk about it in that class. Um, but again, by interacting with others in the social world and by learning this trust or mistrust or a secure attachment or an insecure attachment with your caregiver, you're developing these inter you're developing these internal working models of close relationships. Really, you're learning that predictability of the world. Is the world predictable? Is that person going to be there for you? Or are they not? When you cry out, will they be there for you? Or are they not? Freud has a different take. Again, looking at the unconscious mind, the influence of things like the oral fixation as our way of you know attaching or whatever it is. I love Harlow's rhesus monkey experiments. And then in the rhesus monkey experiments, the question is, do we need our mothers more for food or for water? And the, in, the, in the rhesus monkey experiment, they have the wire monkey and the cloth monkey. The wire monkey has the food. 
And most people go to the wire monkey 10% of the time for the food, and then they go over the cloth monkey the rest of the time. Because it turns out that we really need comfort, that maybe the need for comfort is not just built into humanity, but that's built into many, many species across the planet, for example. Um, Ainsworth breaks out the four attachment styles. So you have Erickson stages, then you have Ains and then Harlow's theory of attachment of comfort needs, then you have Ainsworth th th uh, theories of attachment styles. So again, to break down all people into four types of attachment styles, to me, is pushing it a little bit. I feel like there's more diversity. But again, it's an interesting way to at least perceive this idea of attachment styles. So Bulby breaks it down to the majority, like 60% of people develop these secure relationships, these secure attachments with their caregivers. And they have this study that the book talks about where they're, you know, a baby is brought to a daycare center, there's a stranger there, then the mom leaves the room, or after a little bit of time, how does the kids react? And somehow this shows us whether they have secure or insecure attachment styles. But for secure attachment, and that study, um, when the caregiver is present, the, you know, the little baby goes around and it may talk to the stranger. And in that study, if the baby is resistant, they're kind of wary when their mother leaves or are wary of the stranger and they get really clingy with their parents and they get really upset when the uh, caregiver leaves. There's avoidant, which is they avoid their mother, they avoid the stranger, they're kind of quiet, they kind of keep to themselves. Then there's the disorganized or disoriented attachment style, which is kind of inconsistent. Sometimes it's clingy, sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's happy, sometimes it's angry. And your book does a good job of breaking all that down. But again, is that how all humans work? Do we all just come in one of these four, rather secure or resistant or avoidant or disorganized slash or disoriented? This is a pretty good question that you guys should be asking and actually critiquing and thinking about. Um, but the book also talks about things like how can we help you know, children that to more develop these secure attachments, to have a more positive time, to have the nutrition that they need, to get the support that we need. So things like support for the caregivers. Again, parents aren't given a manual. We're not told right away, here's how you parent. We all have to learn, right? And some may be better than others. That's just another arbitrary question. Or maybe we're all just as good at it, you know? Um, there's social deprivation. Again, is the kid growing up in poverty? Is it being neglected by society and its parents and the caretakers? There's reactin, uh, reactive attachment disorder, which is consistent deprivation and a constant changing of caregivers. And so, again, I always say, you know, what does a kid really need but just some love and some support and some food? I mean, you know, you get some shelter. You get a kid those things, they're going to grow up just fine. Poverty is not associated with mental illness. Okay? Like, again, it's not, which is kind of weird. Because you think like environmental factors, mental illness, right? But again, people that tend to have mental illness and illnesses tend to fall into poverty. But again, if the kid is growing up poor, but as long as he's got some love and enough food to survive and stuff, they will become stable. Temperament. Your book breaks it down to, again, temperament versus personality. And again, do we have an ingrained, inborn temperament? And so, again, that idea that we don't have instincts or we don't have reflexes, again, I go back to questioning that because when you study personality theory, the argument is that half of you is your genes. It's your why you end up like your mothers and your fathers and your aunts and your uncles and your sisters and your brothers. OK, it's because this genetic heritage, this ancestry has been passed down. And within that ancestry is your personality type or at least half of it, the way you hold your body, the way you talk, the way you rock back and forth like I can't stop you know someone in my family probably did this at a time or if I look at my father he probably has his hands going the same way I do you just can't see them because they're below the camera but this whole time they've been moving and so I often wonder you know how much of you is driven by your biology is your biology and your personality and your motivation all these unconscious processes these biological processes how much of that is driving you and so that's your temperament okay your temperament is like that ingrained, what you were born with, kind of way of feeling and acting and behaving and thinking, for example. Um, so Erickson's theory, again, this idea of autonomy versus shame and doubt. Are you confident in who you are? Do you like who you are as a person? Or do you question yourself? And are you insecure? And so we go through these phases. But again, can a two-year-old really go through these things? I don't know. <laughs> Just again, I don't know, you know. 
So I kind of like to think about these biological and unconscious forces more so than like, you know, a two-year-old contemplating whether their identity, they should be proud of it or not proud of it. Okay. But so the book defines temperament as innate. <clears throat> Again, these ingrained biological born with neurophysiologically based characteristics of infants. Okay. That personality that we're born with, I guess, including our mood, activity level and emotional reactivity. And, and they say, again, it's noticeable soon after birth. And the book tries to break down all humans into easy, difficult, and slow to warm kids. And again, I have to ask myself, is this an accurate way to really code people? I mean, is it that easy? Like some kids are just easy and some are difficult and some are just pretty chill. Sometimes negative, apparently. I mean, I've seen ch kids that are super chill that aren't negative. They're very positive. But the book from this uh, table 3.4, as you see on the bottom, slow to warm, often negative in mood. I mean, so, so again, to me, it doesn't really categorize everybody as well as it should. But I do like the interesting idea that we're all born with this ingrained kind of potential for a personality. OK, and then your book defines personality. Again, it's more complex because the personality includes you uh, across the lifespan and how your experiences and your personal cognitions and how you feel and like your observations and your reflections on your feeling. How does all that structure your personality? And so again, who we are is more than just that determined bio you know, biological creature. We have the ability and the social context has the ability to mold our behavior, to mold the way we think, but how much control over our ability to mold that is up for discussion because again, our unconscious mind is very powerful and it wants what it wants. Okay. Like you can try to mold yourself into thinking you're not hungry. It doesn't matter. Your body and your mind are going to be screaming at you. I want food. Okay. So again, that's kind of that conscious versus unconscious and biological processes. So personality is defined as an individual's consistent pattern of feeling, thinking, and behavior. Who are we over time? Which is the result of that continuous interplay between the biological disposition and the experience. Again, that biological temperament and how you yourself and your conscious mind, along with society and agents of socialization out here, have structured who you are as a person. Infant emotions. I love studying emotions because, again, we like to think that there's these finite emotions, but really all emotions are, are combinations of neurotransmitters. And then our brain interpreting those combinations of neurotransmitters. And then we use words that are culturally formed, like anger, to describe how we're feeling. So again, don't just assume that we have emotions that are like peas on a piano. You press level C and you're angry. You hit a D and you're happy. You hit an F and you're sad, okay? It's not that easy. A lot of emotions like chords on a piano or this combination of keys, right? Like F can be happy or it can be sad depending upon if you're playing an F major or an F minor. And if you think about those piano keys as neurons releasing neurotransmitters, you have 88 keys on a piano. You can create a lot of different combinations of feelings and emotions. But just to categorize things, <clears throat> Your book breaks it down into these kind of classifiable emotions that we can attach words to and label. Uh, but at birth, infants exhibit two emotional responses, which the book says are attraction and withdrawal. They show attraction to pleasant situations that bring comfort, simulation, and pleasure, and they withdraw from unpleasant simulation, such as bitter flavors or physical discomfort. And that's interesting because babies are born with what knowing what they like to eat and what they don't. OK, and so like you're like, OK, maybe they do have some emotions that they're born with. And maybe it's just two. I have kids. And for me, just to think babies only have two emotions, attraction and withdrawal seems a little bit shrunk down to me because my babies have had all kinds of feelings as babies. But, <laughs> you know, whatever. Around two months, infants exhibit social engagement in the form of social smiling as they respond with joy to those who engage in their positive attention. Um, pleasure is expressed as laughter at three to five months of age. Pleasure becomes more specific and differentiated as fear, sadness, or anger between ages of six to eight months. And so again, you can kind of see that over time, our emotions are growing and the number of emotions we're feeling are growing. Or is it just that, you know, these feelings are becoming more specific over time, which is basically what it says, you know, between six and eight months, these emotions become much more specific, 
you start to be able to read what a baby's feeling. You kind of get a sense for what's going on with it. Uh, anger or frustration is often expressed in reaction to being prevented from obtaining a goal, such as a toy being removed. Again, your book breaks it down into some of these clever ways, but you know, I personally think it's a lot more complex than that. But you definitely see that the emotional growth comes with feeling your emotions, learning how to express them, learning how to define them, you know, learning what's appropriate and what's not when it comes to expressing them. And this happens throughout the lifetime. But again, as kids early on, this is happening very quickly. Every day they're learning new things. They're learning how to behave. They're learning when to freak out when that's not acceptable and as a parent you're always like no yes no yes no 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 all the time trying to structure your baby's emotions and behavior to get them to act the way you want that's culturally appropriate again as parents as agents of socialization we are structuring our children's lives from day one <laughs> okay we have an influence on them who they end up being okay we influence their personality babies also have fear and again often associated with the presence of a stranger and known as stranger wearing this Babies also may experience separation anxiety, the departure of significant others. Again, are babies attached when they come out of the womb? Of course, they already know their mother's voice. They've been in there for a long time. Uh, types of basic emotions, as I was saying earlier, though, you have these primary emotions of interest, happiness, anger, fear, surprise, sadness, and disgust, which the book says appears first. But then you have these self-conscious or secondary emotions as we evolve, envy, pride, shame, guilt, doubt, and embarrassment. And again, to break it down into these categories is a good way to do it. You know, it's interesting. But again, all of those feelings are a mix. Like you can be embarrassed and sad and crying. You can be embarrassed and super angry. You can be embarrassed and disgusted. You can be embarrassed and surprised. And so again, you know, when you're guilty, you can feel angry. You can feel shame. You can doubt oneself. You can be surprised that your life just ended up here and I just made this bad decision. You can feel sadness like my life is over. I feel so guilty for what I have done. And it just goes on for days like that, right? So all of our emotions are these combinations of feelings. And again, really, that's just our brain interpreting neurons being released. Interesting. Social referencing, again, the process whereby infants seek out information from others to clarify a situation and then use that information to act. Again, we learn from culture. Babies aren't just stimulus and response. They are observing. They are watching constantly. They are learning how to act. Just look at a little kid and how much they always look to their brothers and sisters that are older to figure out how they should behave. It's just built into us to look at other people. Again, that's that theory of mind that comes out later when we can put ourselves in other people's minds. But already these little kids are modeling and imitating behavior, okay? They're watching us, they're listening to us, they're picking up on the cues, they're building associations, they're learning how to act and walk and talk. Emotional rest self-regulation refers to strategies we use to control our emotional states so we can attain our goals. Um, and the book says that young infants struggle with emotional self-regulation. I mean, obviously, right? But again, what cracks me up is like, who does it? Even as adults, we are all still trying to deal with emotional self-regulation. You're in a car and someone cuts you off and you're like, ah. and instead you need to be like, I'm feeling angry right now because that person cut in front of me, but I'm not going to freak out. I'm going to meditate and reflect on it. You know, how many of us are really good at that emotional self-regulation? I mean, divorce rates are really high. Is that why? Is that why there's so much domestic violence and things along those lines later on in life? And as kids going through that, you know, zero to one is the most likely to be abused because of what's going on with the parents. I mean, think about the stress, whatever they might be experiencing. Again, if we had some support for parents, would that reduce zero to one, the most likely to be abused of any age? You are twice as likely to be abused between zero to one than you are at any other age, which is absolutely shocking. But again, is that because of babies struggling with emotional self-regulation? But why as, we, as parents should we expect a zero to one-year-old to have emotional self-regulation? But again, that's that patience and learning how to be a parent. We're not necessarily out of taught how to even cope with that maybe there's some better ways to do it yeah right, side note the development of the sense of self during the second year of life 15 months to 24 uh, months children begin to recognize themselves as they gain a sense of self as a social object okay an awareness of oneself that sense of yourself as separate from the rest of the world those very much so left brain processes 
So self-awareness is the realization that you are separate from others. And this is a uniquely human experience. Not many animals can do this. I'm pretty sure elephants have self-awareness and maybe dolphins also. But other than that, it is very rare um, on this planet. So once a child has achieved self-awareness, the child is moving toward understanding social emotions such as guilt, shame, or embarrassment, as well as sympathy or empathy. And again, just think about as you grow and you get smarter and you become aware of other people's feelings and all of a sudden you feel guilty because you took their toy. And then, you know, kids are struggling with sharing, but then they learn to share. And, you know, this starts to happen about that age, okay? Again, we're social creatures. It's built into us to try to find ways to get along with each other. The development of senses and skills. For motor skills, our ability to move our bodies and manipulate objects um, definitely starts to grow between zero and two. Our gross motor, motor skills, like focusing on large muscle groups that control our head, torso, arms, and legs, and involve larger movements like balancing, running, and jumping. Just look at toddlers. They're just trying to figure it all out. You know, they're running around. They're holding on to things. They're trying to do things they don't know how to do yet. They look a little awkward. They trip over their feet, but eventually they figure it out. And then you have these fine motor skills that keep on developing, using our fingers, toes, and eyes, enabling coordination of small ass, uh, actions like grasping toys, writing with pencils, using a spoon. These things all take time. We have to have that muscle memory that has to grow. And again, the more you practice at it, the more better you get. So every day that a child lives, the more they're practicing living, they're living with their body as human in this world, it gets easier and easier to at least figure it out. I'm not saying life gets easier and easier, but again, these skill developments, our ability to use our body grows with time, okay? We're born unable to, to use any of it. We have the potential for it, but again, we need interaction with other people, and then we need to be able to practice for these skills to actually develop. <clears throat> So our sensory capacities, again, babies are not just automatons. They are constantly absorbing things. Their brain growth is just constantly going on. That's why they sleep so much, 18 hours a day. Okay, they wake up six hours, they take in a bunch of information, then they fall asleep and their brain starts to code all that information. The vision is poor until about 15 months to four years when it starts to fully develop. Um, babies are facially oriented. They are obsessed with faces. Is that built into our genetics to want to look at faces? Why? Again, going back to that, we're social creatures. They, uh, the binocular vision using both eyes begins about the third month to the sixth month. Um, keen at birth. Babies are very keen at birth. They know their mother's voices. They know similar sounds. Babies even know stories. Like if you read babies the same story in a womb, and then when the baby is born, read three different stories and one of them being that story you read to them in the womb every night, they're going to like that story more. They're going to respond to it. They're going to start suckling and doing all these things to like, let you know, I know that story. I heard it in the womb, which is wild to think about. But yeah, dude, that baby's memory is growing in the womb. Fascinating, right? Touch and pain, babies know it. Don't assume that they're babies, that they can't feel it. Taste and smell. Preferences are innate. They prefer sweet tastes and they like the smell of their mothers. <laughs> That's just straight out of the book, right? And then habituation over time, children learn about stimuli. They learn combinations of stimuli. They become habituated to certain stimuli. They learn to block out certain stimuli. And your unconscious mind does that over time. Like you guys probably don't hear the air conditioning running all the time. And it's because your unconscious mind isn't telling your conscious mind to pay attention to the air conditioner unless something's wrong. And all of a sudden it's like sends a signal to your unconscious mind, like, Hey, pay attention to the air conditioner. And so that's how it is with the world. There's so much noise going on all the time, but our conscious mind can't take in all that stimuli. Our con unconscious mind is deciding which of that information to send to our conscious mind. For example, that's habituation. So brain organization fascinated with the neuroscience of brain organization again when you think about the brain it really is you know it's been compared to a computer a lot like right like you have this ram this capacity for memory and then the brain just just start filling the brain with information you start building it with files you upload all your pictures you upload all your data and then you organize it all into files that's what schematic organization of the brain looks like like you have skyscrapers. Of, I like to think about it as a city all the time. Like think about your brain is like Chicago and you have a skyscraper for dogs, a skyscraper for math, a skyscraper for family members or whatever it might be. And your brain has coded information, organized it in such a way that enables you to be able to learn, 
about the environment, the information you need to know to survive. So your brain is constantly assimilating old information into these the schematic network, or it's accommodating new information by creating new schemas and expanding the knowledge network. And again, all knowledge is is really stored memories. So again, if you, I like to think about it like, you know, how do you know how to talk? Well, your brain has memorized these sounds and then what those sounds mean or what they're attached to. And then you're able to retrieve that knowledge and then go ahead and speak. But if you stroke out in the knowledge part of your brain, all of a sudden you can't have lose the ability to speak, for example. But that's why, because that's where all that information is stored, for example. So your book talks about organization. Again, the way we combine existing schemas into new or complex ones. Our brain is like a file cabinet that is constantly expanding. And we do grow through life and learn and learn and learn. And you guys are in college. So right now, your brain is taking in this information it's encoding it as memories. Some of it's going to be put in long-term memory. Some of it's a short-term memory, and you're going to forget the next day or even seven minutes later. Um, but your brain is deciding for you what information it wants to keep as old information and which information it wants to discard, which you would, uh, you know, listen, if we had a big lecture on memory, which we do like an intro class or something like that. Um, your book, your, brain, your book also talks about disequilibration, which is we detect discrepancies or contradictions between the models we are constructing. Again, if your brain has outdated data, you can figure that out. Like you can be like, oh, I was wrong there. I need to redo and rethink how I do that to do it better next time. That's like a golf swing, right? Like if you had your natural golf swing and all of a sudden you're like, that golf swing is wrong. I have a better one. So basically your brain will go in, cut a bunch of things, and then, you know, not really, I'm just joking, but you'll go in and you'll change the way you think about your golf swing, and then you'll approach your golf swing, your body movements in a different way. And then it has equilibration, which is attempts to readjust actions and models so that they are better aligned. Again, you can either just retrain your brain, or you can just reorganize information and make it so it makes a little bit more sense than it did before. So again, with the stage theories, again, we have Erickson's stage theories, we have Piaget's uh, stage theories, Piaget talks about the sensory motor stage. Piaget, though, is one of the first researchers to argue that infants are intelligent, and again, they're constantly taking information, they're developing this schematic knowledge, and according to Piaget in perspective, infants learn about the world primarily through their senses and motor abilities, okay? So it, Piaget breaks it down into the stages of stage one, reflexes, Stage two, kids start to use their body. Stage three, we learn to interact with objects. Stage four, we go engage in goal-seeking behavior. Stage five, we become little scientists exploring the whole world. And stage six, we start to be able to use that symbolic language, symbolic thinking, using language, and engaging in problem solving, okay? And then object permanence. When their babies are babies, you know, their mom leaves, they think it's gone forever. It doesn't mean your mom's gone, it just means your mom's in the next room. And that's the idea that, you know, over time a, a child does learn, you know, that abstract thinking that just because something's not there, that it can be over there, for example. So again, memory development, I've hit on a little bit of this. But again, memories are really just neurons releasing neurotransmitters that are stored. Um, your book talks about infantile amnesia, the inability to recall memories from the first few years of your life. The really good debate is why don't you have any of the memories from when you were the baby? And there's many reasons for why you can't, you know, remember anything since before you were three. A biological reason is the brain is just too immature at the time and it didn't organize things properly, for example. A psychological theory might be lack of linguistic skills. Once you learn language, your brain starts to organize things differently. Because again, your brain is organizing things when you're a baby into schemas. But once you learn language, then those become like the I don't know, headings for the categories and your brain will start to reorganize things based upon the fact that you're using language now to code information. Whereas before language, you coded information in a different way. Easiest way to think about it. And then a sociological approach would be episodic memories and personal experiences may hinge on an understanding of the self. And so again, until your self truly forms who you are as a person, the structure of the brain, things along those lines, you know, that part of yourself is just kind of lost. The use of language, again, language is a system of communicating that uses symbols in a regular way to create meaning. Language is innate. However, reading is not, which is why kids struggle with reading. Reading is symbols that we made up, and then we have to teach you what those symbols mean 
And then you have to know when you see that symbol, it makes this sound and that combination of symbols makes that word. But again, language, the use of language is built in. Um, if you take, there's been stories of, you know, deaf children that have just been left completely alone, very depressing, dark stories, but they will come up with their own form of language on their own. There are stories of, you know, children in, that are abused and locked in closets that also come up with some form of language. However, it may not develop to the extent that our cultural languages develop. Again, that interacting with other people, that transmission of cultural knowledge is the root of real deep linguistic abilities, okay? Um, but language consists of phonemes, which is those smallest sounds. Like my wife's name is Ina, which is two sounds, E and Na, or maybe that's Na, uh, maybe it's three sounds, one or two at least. So it's one or two, it's two phonemes, maybe three. But again, the morpheme for her name is Ina, the whole word Ina, the combination of those morphemes, the combination of those parts that make up the whole. So the phonemes are the syllables and the morphemes I like to think of as the words. Uh, semantics are the set of rules we use to obtain meaning from the morphemes. Again, our brain and it's arguable whether our brain naturally has a way of you know, rhythmically using language. And so that's a good debate, whether it's biologically built in for us, the rhythm of the language, so to speak. That's how I think about the semantics, the rules, how words are used, how phonemes and morphemes are combined, or how much of that is socially constructed. We constructed a language in the social context. We then teach kids how to use that language from birth. So by the time they're five, they're reading books and then they can go to school and rock it out. Um, then your book also talks about pragmatics, how we communicate effectively and appropriately with others. And again, it's broken into us to use language to communicate with others. We are social beings. Social interaction is necessary. Babies don't survive on their own in the wild at birth. Okay, they need care. They need interaction. And again, contextual information. We also use information from the environment, from all the other senses to figure out what people are trying to say. Uh, language development, the order in which children learn language structures is consistent across, the, it's universal, essentially. So again, that ability to learn language, you could argue exists, and that it's a universal process, okay? Starting before birth, babies begin to develop language and communication skills. At birth, babies recognize their mother's voice and can discriminate between languages spoken by mothers in foreign languages. Babies, if their mother is French, they prefer French over German. It's just one of those things. And like, there's been a ton of studies on this, but yeah, like, so again, in the womb, you're picking up stuff. You're picking up information so much that like, you like the sound of your native language more than other languages, which is kind of wild, right? Uh, but that's pretty cool. Uh, babies also prefer when the language and the face are in sync. Babies know when you're like, you put it, if you do a face talking English and a face speaking French, the baby's like, what's up? I don't like this. <laughs> and then there's the differentiation between speaking and body language. Babies, again, can't use spoken words, but again, they have body language very early. Plus they have those sounds, uh, cooing, for example, crying out to me is a word, <laughs> you know? So again, uh, babies can replicate sounds from their own languages, and they can also do plenty other languages that they're exposed to, you know, depending on what they're, you know, around. Um, babies engage in babbling, uh, intentional vocalizations, and also receptive language. Babies, even though they can't necessarily talk, they start to understand what you're saying, okay? So by 10 months, that baby's pretty like, I know what's up, I know what you mean, you know, like it's pretty smart little baby by then. Uh, theories of language development, again, nativism is the brain has a language acquisition device. That's what I keep talking about. Do we have that genetic capacity for language? Is that human? Is it universal for all humans? Um, we have also the idea that we have deep structures of ideas and surface structures. Your book breaks it down into like this lecture. You're not going to remember everything I said, but you might have a sense of what I'm saying. So that surface structure is every word I said versus the deep structure, which is the fundamental ideas. And that's how your brain organizes things too. It doesn't necessarily organize things verbatim. Even your memories might not be exact memories. It might just be the gist of your experience, which is interesting. Your brain is constantly pruning and organizing things as it will, okay? Uh, but then you also have things like learning theory, stimulus response. Um, you know, we learn through stimulus and response. That's how we develop. 
uh, through reinforcement, through observation, social learning. I mean, there's just so many theories we could attach. Uh, areas of the brain for language, 90% uh, of people are right-handed. I tend to ask why, but I think this is probably because, you know, the main language centers are in the left part of the brain. And again, the brain flip-flops everything. So again, we're mostly right-handed so that these signals go to the left side of the brain, for example. Uh, but yeah, language is stored and controlled by the left cerebral cortex. Although for some left-handed people, this is reversed. Broca's area is an area in the front of the left hemisphere near the motor cortex that's responsible for language production. And then Wernicke's area is uh, next to the auditory cortex responsible for comprehension. And then damage to any of these areas will either affect your ability to use language or your ability to comprehend language. Um, and then finally, the critical period for language. Is there a critical period? Arguably, yes. For you to fully to you know, form the ability to use language and manipulate words, phonemes and morphemes like we do, you know, that does take a lot of social interaction, a lot of development. Okay. And so again, I talked about some of the sad stories about children who have been abused and locked in closets for long periods of time or deaf children that were neglected. And again, they will come up with their own language. However, after a certain point, the book says between infancy and puberty, it's very hard after that to really be able to have that rich, deep ability to use language. Okay. Thank you so much.